Paxa presents Call the Coach with Hawaii Volleyball Coach Charlie Wade. Brought to you by HGEA, Hawaii Pacific Health, Castle Resorts and Hotels, HCAMP, IBEW Local 1186, and Ruby Tuesday Hawaii. For the final time here in 2024, we welcome you here to Ruby Tuesday here in the Moan Lewis Shopping Center. Call the Coach with Head Coach Charlie Wade. I'm Tiff Wells again. 808-296-1420 is the number to call in or text. Or if you have a question in-house, you can find Cole Malsoff or you can ask Keegan Olta. Give them the high sign. We have a microphone, and you can ask your question live to uh, head coach Charlie Wade. Coach, since last time we were here, uh, you went 4-2, and two, wins over a win over UC San Diego, a win over UC Irvine, two wins uh, on senior weekend over UC Santa Barbara kind of your general thoughts of where the team is uh, heading into the postseason beginning on Thursday? Yeah, fair question. Um, <laughs> you know, it's been uh, a little up and down. So, uh, you know, but overall, I think we've seen um, we've seen enough progress to know that we're still moving forward. You know, obviously, um, we haven't didn't win as many matches as we're used to. But at the end, you know, there, there are some some moments in time where we're playing pretty good volleyball. You know, the the I'm trying to think which match it was on uh, on Friday night down in San Diego. You know, we we've talked a lot about um, how many the errors per set. You know, it's something that we've judged ourselves on for years now, and and uh, uh, we've been if not the best, really close to it. Prior to um, conference play, through the non-conference part of the season, we were averaging seven point four errors a set, um, and that was the best in the country. And then we get into the conference play and, you know, with Spirosa, whatever. I mean, it, it, you know, we, were, we, were, we were in the 10, 11 errors a set range, and that's absolutely dead medium. And then um, we've seen when we've played well, like and I, and I mentioned that Friday night, um, we had made 16 errors through two sets, which is eight, which is a, a decent number. Um, and then we won the third set. Uh, or excuse me, the fourth set and only made five errors. So in the three sets that we won, we made 21 errors, uh, which is seven per set, a really nice number. And then you have the the third set that we lost and we made 16 errors in that single set. Um, so that's um, kind of the good and the bad of it, you know, but we see enough. There's enough good where um, we're pretty hopeful going into the weekend. And I'll say this, too, uh, just being back in the Stan Sheriff Center this week has been uh, really good. And you see that, I mean, there is uh, some mana in that building that really, um, really has the guy playing well. But, you know, both Louie and Keone are serving really well. And even even our serving subs today serve well. So um, looking forward to the weekend. Already five minutes in, Coach, we have a text that has come in. It says, Coach, Aloha, arguably the three toughest teams up next in a row. If everything goes chalk, it would be Santa Barbara, Irvine, and Long Beach State. For you, how do you plan to maintain – wow. How do you maintain focus, mindset, and the stamina to win the Big West title to go three matches in three days with three wins? Well, I mean, that'll – We'll see if we do, right? I mean, that's you certainly can. I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I, I put uh, I'm not sure I put Santa Barbara in, in the top three in terms of toughest matches either. I mean, they they played us tough, but um, you know they did finish sixth in the league. Then um, you know, and then again, just you know, we're certainly we're mindful of uh, playing three games in a row this weekend. You know, so you know, you know we haven't. We haven't gone terribly long um, yesterday or today, and we're not, you know, trying to limit the number of jumps. And, and really in any year when um, you get into the postseason like this, there is a finite number of jumps that are left inside these guys. And you don't want them out there, like, just beating on them at practice and um, and, and making more jumps than they really need to. So I think we've pretty done a pretty good job of being able to manage that. You know, the other part of it, um, you know, the mindset and, like I said, just the – you know, the kind of the mental fortitude that it takes. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, that, that's that's always the test. Um, you know, I'm thrilled that we're uh, playing at home in the friendly confines of the Stan Sheriff Center in front of a few thousand of our closest friends. And, I mean, that, like I said, that's, that, that is always kind of the wind in our sails. And, and clearly when you get in that building and start going for us, anyway, there is, there is some mana, there is some energy to it. 
Um, and you see the guys just, you know, their, their posture's different, the energy's different, and, uh, you know, looking forward to, to getting out and competing this weekend. You've mentioned the finite jumps, and you've said that not just this year, but also, you know, last the last few years with, with this team coming into the postseason. But as a general health of the team, how are they adding? A lot of people have been specifically asking – uh, we saw him a little bit in that second match on Saturday against UC San Diego, but specifically, how is Chaz Galloway doing? It's pretty good. I mean, look sharp today. You know, it's it, and again, it, you know, it was a kind of decision that we've made going forward where if we roll him out there and play him every minute of every day for the this last kind of month and a half of the season, um, he he'll he will not be optimal, right? He won't be at a hundred percent. And there's a part of it too where the uh, you know, because the the um, because of what we do statistically and what how we need to score, um, there's been a little more emphasis on that on the scoring and the serving potential of putting Keone and Louis ba- both out there at the same time. Um, really gives us our the best chance to for us to be our best because they're you know their their serving can be so impactful. Um, you know, Chaz is a, a veteran, a professional. Like he's, he really, he's, he's played a lot. You know, he he did a really nice job coming in off the bench um, for us the other night. And at at this point, that's kind of his role. You know, and it it's it's it allows him to be at his best when he is called upon. And uh, you know, at the same time, lets us kind of roll the dice a little bit and see if we can, um, you know, kind of push the envelope in terms of the scoring from the service line for us. But, um, you know, really impressed with Chaz and how he's kind of navigated this this last part of his career. And I said he came in off the bench the other night and and played great. And the reality is we have not finished with the same guys on the floor that we've started with for a while now. So um, he's a pretty important piece for us. And for a senior for him, I mean – you don't want to say that Thursday could potentially be his last game and a few for the seniors as well. But for a, a guy that has been a starter and a mainstay in that lineup throughout his career to be coming off the bench and to still be not just contributing when he is called upon, but to be one of those guys as a cheerleader on the bench, rooting on the guys. And then, you know, when you come in on breaks and timeouts and stuff and he's he's there, he's giving positive feedback. What does it kind of say about his character, not just as a, as a player, but as a teammate? Yeah, no, he's been great. Like I say, he's been professional. There are times, you know, even throughout the year when I've, you know, you, you make that choice and you go a different direction. And, um, you know, I, I've I've approached him a couple times after matches. And, um, you know, he's like, look, coach, I trust you. Just do what you got to do. It's all good. You know, he's not, he's not really one that's looking at the stats and counting numbers and stuff. He knows, he kind of sees the big picture and knows, um, you know, if and when is needed, he's going to be ready and um he, you know, he's always played big for us in big matches. Again, the number 808-296-1420 to call or text. We did mention we've had this all season long. You can ask questions from the audience. And I believe, Cole, you have Michael in the audience who wants to ask a question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Coach. Thank you, Tiff. Uh, my question is, um, so no doubt that Shred um, has played very well this year and technically you sh- should be a senior in high school. Um now, what's the thought process as far as bringing players into the program that would be seniors in high school? Because you know, the, the more experience they have, the better players they are. So if, you know, let's say Tread was still in high school, he would technically be an even better setter next year as a freshman. Like, what's the thought process in trying to that fine yeah, line between no, bringing a player over r- early? Really good question. Thanks for asking it. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm in a unique situation right now, and I can I can certainly speak to exactly how kind of treads unfolded. But um, I'm in the same situation with my son. You know, he was player of the year last year as a sophomore in high school. And um, the short of it is they're ready to play at the next level. And for them staying um, at the high school and club level, it is going to stunt their development rather than being in our practice gym and competing against adult men. If we lived anywhere else on the planet, players of this caliber would be playing against adult men since the time they were like 15, 16 years old. In, in, in cases of the elite players like Trad and Kainoa, it would be even earlier. 14, 15, you're in the gym playing against adult men. Um, you know, I was... Uh, uh, thinking the other day how Tread, when he uh, he approached me about coming early, he came in and watched us in uh, in Irvine in a in a fall match, 
And at that time, and when he started putting this in play to come and be here, the entire lineup was going to be intact. Um, and it would just change him for Jakob Tele. Cole Hoglin uh, had another year of eligibility. Cole was the rookie of the year in the V League, in one of the best professional leagues in the world in Japan. Demetrius Muklius is playing in the Bundesliga in Germany. He had another year of eligibility. These guys graduated and, and you know, just kind of got on with their careers. Brett Sheward would be on the floor with us, et cetera. And obviously Spiros um, and Chaz, you know, all these guys would be back there. So literally the entire starting lineup would be – would have been intact off two national championships and it would have been just Jakob for tread. I think things would have looked a lot different with that lineup on the floor the whole time for the 17 year old coming in and taking over. But um, you have to be impressed with what tread has been able to do. You know, we've never been lower than third in the country in team hitting percentage the entire year with this kind of makeshift lineup and a, and a 17 year old freshman setter and, and team hitting percentage is one that um, you know is, is a setter stat right it really speaks to the level of um, how efficient and how productive your setter is you know and then you, the other part of it too and look at what he's done with jump serving he and whether well, there's national team club team he was not a, a spin spike server they wouldn't allow him to do it. And, um, you know, he's serving in bounds at a really high percentage, and his, his aces per set are among the, the leaders in the country. So um, I think 100% it's, it was the right thing for him to do. And, and certainly, you know, you could say he would have been better, but ah, hard to say, like, at that point. When he, he won the national championship as a setter, um, at the club level, he's been a starting setter on our, you know, U19, now U21 national team. He clearly is ready to play at the next level. And you look at his performance this year, I don't think there's any question that he is among the elite setters in the collegiate game as a 17-year-old. And he's younger than your son. He is, and that's the, the joke now where <laughs> Kainoa is now two years behind Tread in school because – Tread's on our team now, and Kainoa is a junior in high school. Kainoa is one week older than Tread. Kainoa <laughs> is June 26, 06, and Tread is uh, July 3rd, 06. Michael, that's a good question, so thank you for that. And, Coach, you know, we're kind of just talking about, you know, when we found out, you know, the unfortunate news with, with Spiros, and, and you mentioned you've got five weeks to figure out a lineup. Are you comfortable with how they've performed despite the 5-5 five and five conference record? Are you comfortable with – what has been on the floor and how they've continued to get better results aside? Well, I'd still rather have Spiros out there, but, uh, you know, we're, we're making the most of what we got for sure. And the guys, look, they've, they've worked really hard. I think we're, uh, we're kind of a closer team right now because of it, you know, because, you know adversity, you know, kind of those kind of calluses through the hard work and stuff really have kind of hardened everybody. And I think we're a better team right now. And, um, you know, like I said, it, it's been a, it's been quite a journey for everyone, players, coaches, fans, everybody to kind of go through this. And uh, looking forward to uh, to getting out there this week and and competing. And you know, I was, I've been impressed with what we've seen in the practice gym. And um, you know, I'm, like I said, I, I like our chances going into the weekend. One more text that has come in uh, before we go to our first break. This one comes from Irvine with the ESPN Plus crew of uh, Rob Sparrow and Charlie Brand. They asked, Coach, he was on the bench for senior night. Might we see Spiros on the bench this weekend? Yeah, I, you know, he's, we're, you're only allowed, you have to limit the – you only can have 15 credentialed players. And um, I talked to Spiros yesterday for a little bit and um, – said if you want one you got it for sure and um so he will be one of the credentialed players he might be kind of sitting on the uh the treatment table in the corner a little bit because um sitting in a, a, a traditional seated position is still a little more difficult from him he might be laying on the um on the trainer's table in the tunnel but he absolutely will be in the locker room and be you know part of our team all weekend Time to take our first break from Ruby Tuesday here in the Mola Shopping Center more to come from Call the Coach here on ESPN Honolulu
Call the Coach with Charlie Wade on ESPN Honolulu. So much fun here for Ruby Tuesday here in the Moolo Shopping Center. Tip Bulls here along with the head coach of Hawaii men's volleyball, Charlie Wade. Coach, during the break, we actually had one of our one of our giveaways from Chris Hart, who was here tonight. And uh, the back of the T-shirt for the practice shirt you guys have, it says Alaka'i, as opposed to what maybe some of the mainland announcers may say that word in some way, shape, or form. But if you could, we know it's an acronym, but can you kind of go over every, every part of that acronym for us? Sure, and that's something that we, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll even go back a little farther too. When I, you know, as a, as an assistant coach for years, it was always like, okay, what do we, what defines us? You know, what are we going to be about? And um, it's one of those things. An assistant coach, I said, when I become a head coach, you know, I really want it clearly defined on what it means to be a part of our team. So when I left here in 2005 and became the head coach uh, at Pacific in 2006, I took the Pacific word mark and I kind of mutated it into AFPAC. And AFPAC was academics, fitness, passion, attitude, choices. You know, and these are, um, um, that, that was the first iteration of it. And then when I came back to University of Hawaii, um, the first version of it was VASTEC, and it was volleyball, academic strength, teamness, energy, choices. And then somewhere, yeah, um, after, in, Maybe around 2012, 13, 14, um, I was introduced uh, by my good friend Al Chi to uh, uh, Judge Thomas Kalakakui. He's a retired mm-hmm. federal judge. He's the, you know, part of the Queen Lulio Kalani Trust and really a respected member of the Hawaiian community. And, and we sat down and, and um, you know, I explained to him what it was. And he's like, you know, he's, he's also someone that does a lot of um, – speaking on leadership and stuff he goes this is this literally is the same stuff that that we're teaching and he, and he helped us kind of brand it into Hawaiian language and Hawaiian culture you know um, I'm very fortunate that my my sons are of Hawaiian descent and you know I've been able to attend Kamehameha and I really felt that um, there was a responsibility to help perpetuate Hawaiian language and Hawaiian culture, not only to the people here, um, but we bring in these guys from all over the planet, right? And if we can do something to help, again, perpetuate Hawaiian language and Hawaiian culture across the world, um, this would be a really powerful thing. And, and, and while those guys are here, to have, him, have them understand more about Hawaii than just the weather and the huge crowds at the volleyball and stuff. So... Um, Alakai is an acronym. Alakai is a Hawaiian word for leader, uh, for leadership, and um, the same six categories that we uh, that I identified very early on in my career. Three of them are um, kind of hard data. They are numbers that you generate. Uh, the first one in Alakai is Akamai, which is smart. It's the academic piece. It's literally been the first one. Um, well. I switched it to Vaztec. It was volleyball. I was a little more into it then. Um, but there's always been that academic component to it. Um, and, and Judge Kalakakui helped us kind of take each of these and not only put, give it a Hawaiian word, but then um, give it some symbolism too. And when we when we acknowledge those the people who win each of these categories, there's um, kind of a piece of art, a trophy that goes with it. And um, for Akamai, it is uh, a fish hook. Um, and as it was related to me, the you know in Hawaiian culture, the the, the fishermen were you know some of the smartest people uh, in the village. They were responsible for for feeding everyone. Um, so I started to say the the three that are hard data is the academic component, the strength component, and this is just a matrix of um, running, jumping, lifting, and stuff that we've done. Um, that one now is uh, a poi pounder. It's the I in Alakai is Ikaika. Um, and then uh, the third one is um, Alapa, and that is uh, skill. And this was the volleyball part in Vaztec. And we keep track of stats in the fall, and they're all, all the stats that we keep track of are all in full sets to 25. So everybody has an equal chance to kind of post a number. That is something that you do very specifically. Um, the, the skill uh, award is an ulumaika, which is a game of skill in Hawaiian culture. Um, and then the three that are more subjective and, and harder to quantify, but I, and there is stuff that everybody agrees is really, really important into team culture. Um, 
and that is uh, the K is Kuliana. Um, Kuliana is responsibility. Um, uh, the L is Lokahi, uh, kind of t the, what I call teamness, you know, and how we work together. And um, the third A is uh, Akeu, which is mana. I've used that word, you know, the spirit, the energy of Ku. And that's actually the trophy is a, is a, is an image of Ku. That's the one that's a little harder to quantify. You know, when we, we do it by having uh, everybody gets a ballot. And they get to rank themselves and everyone else. And you're going on a scale of 1 to 10, how you think each guy uh, rates on that. And, and, and it's, it's none of the coaches vote. It's all done among the players. And it's really used as kind of a snapshot to tell the guys what the group thinks of them. Because very, very common, like a young guy comes in and he's like, man, I'm working really hard. This is the hardest I've ever worked, everything. And then he sees his score and it's like, well, wait a minute. I, I think I'm working a lot harder than that. And I'm like, well, you, you're you're working harder than you ever have. But the group, you know, still gave you a seven, right? It's no, nowhere near a ten. So there's more in you. And you know, there's it really has turned into kind of an interesting social experiment over the years too, where um, once in a while you'll see where um, someone who is well respected or highly rated by the group and getting a lot of high scores and all of a sudden like wait a minute this guy's giving him a two <laughs> like a, something here and it, it really is um he has more information or he has very specific information so there's a lot of these kind of situations that come up and it, it turns out to be really valuable to me to be able to see things like this, to see a potential conflict and able to resolve it and get past it. And there's also a part two where the guys who are able to um, really have a pulse on the group to look at it and know, like you look at their scores and it's like they absolutely are dead on where everybody uh, kind of is in the group. Those guys are really valuable to have in the gym because they, as a coach, they help you, you know, because I'm only around them. Like, you know, at practice and the games and stuff, I'm, I'm around them a lot less than they are around each other. And to have this kind of insight and this feedback um, internally, and it is, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, confidential. Like nobody sees the numbers, the, f the final numbers but me and stuff, although we do talk about it. You know, guys, and you know, if I see something um, that I think I need to bring up to somebody, like, hey, Why'd you give the guy a two? You know, like if um, we can have that conversation, but um, that whole you know kind of alakai leadership matrix for us. And the end of it is, as I started the journey of in coaching and thinking, um, you know, wh who are we? What are we about? Uh, you know, as I read lots of stuff, whether it was Wooden, Shashevsky, anything that I could find um, about coaches and 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 even stuff into business where it was good to great built to last and all the Malcolm Gladwell stuff and reading a, a lot of kind of the reoccurring themes that came up were figure out what it's important and focus on what you can control and these six categories are absolutely things that the guys can control themselves and if our focus is from the time that I get up in the morning and my feet hit the ground before my head hits the pillow if I'm focused on these six things all day uh, we're going to be pretty good and at the end of it, if they give us the you know, big shiny trophy at the end, great. Um, but if they don't, then each of these individuals has learned a set of life skills that are going to allow them to be successful in everything they do in the rest of their life. Because we see people all the time that, you know, in varying levels of success in different ages in their life, they either get caught up in stuff that doesn't matter or obsessed over things that um, are out of their control. So it's kind of been our, you know, uh, like I said, our, our mantra, our – kind of way our, our pathway to success and uh it, it's it's proven to be pretty successful for us i think we all learned a lesson there that was, that yeah, was, you, that was, be careful the questions you <laughs> ask that wasn't quite sound bite you got a little more than you wanted to i guess no we all we all needed to see that but um so much so much that uh we'll take another break so we'll, we'll be back I'll for ruby that. tuesday here in the moalo shopping center right here on espn honolulu UH Athletics invites you to join us as we induct the newest class into the Circle of Honor at the Green and White Hello, Celebration, Sunday, May 5th at the Royal Hawaii.
1020 AM and 92.7 FM, part of the IO family of companies. This is Call the Coach with Charlie Wade on ESPN Honolulu. Second half of Call the Coach here from Ruby Tuesday here in the Moalo Shopping Center. Tip Fultz here along with head coach Charlie Wade. Again, 808-296-1420, the number to text or call. If you have a question in-house, you can find Cole, you can find Keegan, give them the high sign and you can ask your question live to Coach. Coach, while we were in the break, we did get a couple of texts that came in. One that asks specifically uh, about night number one against UC San Diego says, Coach, what goes into regrouping the team after a loss like that last game, losing a set 25-12? Is it only reviewing the stats, emphasizing those and the skills? Or is some sports psychology come to players? Is it kind of a combination of everything? Well, that was uh, pretty unique. I'm not sure we got it handed to us that <laughs> handily for quite a while. And uh, look, that 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 I just kind of downplayed. To me, that's a bit of an anomaly. I'm not going to get caught up in in the the score of that. It was pretty obvious that we were just making a boatload of errors, um, and a very kind of rare. You notice I didn't even call a second timeout. You know, we'd won we the first. It. We we won the first two sets pretty handily, and then we just all of a sudden just made a boatload of errors early, and it was like, all right, let's just turn the page on this and let's get to the, um, let's get back to the fourth set. And you know, we ended like I said, we made eight errors, uh, average in the first two sets, and then um, the kind of. I could come up with a lot of kind of soiled ourselves a bit in the third set. And then, you know, we made we made five errors in the fourth set, which is uh, really elite, really efficient, really productive. No hitting errors, and um, I, you know, like I said, I think it was the right thing at that point. You don't want to you want to start rubbing their nose in it. You don't need to bring it up. Like I said, I didn't even call the second time out. Let's just turn the page and get on to the next set. This is the sixth week, the sixth year of the Big West for you folks and with having the conference and the former conference that you were in, the MPSF. Someone asks on Facebook their question from Lewis. They ask, what is maybe the biggest difference or maybe what is what sets apart the Big West from when Hawaii was back in the MPSF? Well, I mean, the, the, the biggest difference is that when it was the just – conference of death when we all 13 it was at that time 13 west coast teams were all in the same league literally in the first week of january you just start banging heads against each other and it's a it's brutal it was so physically demanding and you notice at the end um you know this is it kind of coincided with um the midwest and the east kind of improving the west coast was still had all the best teams but by the end we were just beat to death and you look where Loyola won two years in a row Ohio State won two years in a row the West Coast teams weren't winning because we were just so beat up and then once you saw the league split you've seen only West Coast teams win since then the Big West won and now UCLA won last year and but and the biggest difference is that we you know the growth of men's volleyball where there's been more leagues there's been more teams we just aren't have beaten the snot out of each other the whole week. So January and February are much more humane, are much more, you know, you have an opportunity to play the bench. You have an opportunity to, you know, roll your guys out there and play one night and go 3-0, bang, bang, get done, get in, get out, where it's not just an absolute dogfight every year. And if you have a sprained ankle or somebody gets the flu or something that you don't go on a, you know, a, a one or two or three, four match losing streak because you have a significant injury, you know, you're able to, to navigate that first part of the s- schedule uh, a lot more, you know, and, and I think the second part of that question was about the difference between the big West and the MP- MPSF. Look at that point, like the, 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 the big West has jumped out, you know, in the, in this first five, six years and won a majority of the national championships. And again, this year we have three in the top five, virtually the whole year. Somewhat all of that is cyclical, right? We're, we're in the first, we're not even through the first decade of it. So if it continues for that for another decade, then it will be like, wow, we really um, have something that's separating us. But at the end, there's not that big a difference between the two leagues. Um, it is still the majority of the best teams in the country. And, um, and again, you're looking at the top five, top six. They're all from the same two leagues. Um, and uh, that's the way it's always been. It is awards week this week. We saw the MPSF awards come out, and the Big West ones should probably be coming out tomorrow or Thursday. In your mind, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah. On your team, who would be the most improved player on your roster? 
Huh, that's a good question. Might have to be Louie, you know, just because of where he came from not playing at all and we saw stuff. But, um, um, you know, Tread's also gotten better as the season's gone on. You know, Kurt has played really well for the last couple of weeks. He was he was doing well and they kind of dropped off, but really he's kind of come back um, a little bit. So, um, you know, I, I think we're kind of a unique situation where, you know, we've – We've had just such a, a, a change and, and kind of upheaval to the roster that, um, you know, it's been hard for guys to really kind of get into a rhythm. But um, they're all kind of improving, and, uh, you know, we'll see who's uh, who gets recognized tomorrow. I, you know, I, we have for the last several years dominated those um, those postseason awards, and I'm just going to guess again and, and everything in a bit of a cyclical nature that uh, – you won't see us with five, six uh, all-conference selections tomorrow. That that's, It's going to get spread out a little bit. And you look at the way the league is played. There, it, it has been more spread out this year. You've seen everybody now twice. If you had – I mean, obviously you said you, had a, you have a vote and whatnot, but if you would have a couple of maybe guys to key on for maybe freshman of the year, player of the year, who would you see on a short list for both of those awards? Yeah, I mean, freshman of the year, I don't think it's even close. And frankly, I'll be disappointed if, if Tread doesn't win nationally. Like I said, his team's not been out of the top three in team hitting percentage. His team's been ranked in the top five the entire year. Like, there's just, there's no other freshman that's contributing to a top five team like that. Um, uh, so I think that quite that's an that's an easy one. And in our league, the only other one, well, there's there's two probably that could be in the conversation. Uh, one would be Louie, who's played a fair amount of time, and then uh, the opposite from Northridge, uh, Phillips is mm -hmm. um, the only one that really contributing in a significant way to a to a team in the league. Um, Player of the year is a whole different category, you know, because they're. You know, like Long Beach wins the league, and typically the guy's going to come from that team, and they don't really have that kind of dominant six-rotation point score. You know, their best players, the middle Towery, it's hard to give um, a player of the year to a middle, although the MPSF did today mm -hmm. and gave it to McHenry, so Towery uh, might get it. You know, for me, the, the best player in the league has been Heno. You know, six-rotation point score, does a lot of stuff on it. He, can, he serves, and, you know, even though he's not the kind of – you know, traditional dominant six rotation point score where he's just crushing every ball, but he, at the end of the day, he still scores. And he's, I think he's, uh, you know, one of the front runners for national player of the year as well. Got another text that's come in. says, Coach, we go back to senior night against Santa Barbara. Uh, that fifth set, saw a couple of cards. Can you share what happened with the red card on senior night? Yeah, and I look. I can go, kind of go through the whole thing where we we start the fifth set. We you know we put Keone in at the end of the fourth, so he's on the game in, in the early in the in the fifth set. He gets his first kill um, at whether it was two three points into it, whatever. And you know he's a fiery guy, and um, the up ref red cards him for celebrating he didn't swear he didn't like call anybody out and it's not like he's been out there freaking chirping for two hours and the the up ref goes straight to the yellow card on him and it's like that was that was a mistake for sure and he he, he shouldn't have done it you know he he didn't it didn't it, that did not warrant um and especially the same up ref was the guy that a couple weeks earlier had ref the santa barbara uh Long Beach State game where the coaches almost got a fight and stuff, and he let that thing devolve into chaos. Um, so maybe he was just trying to, you know, flex his muscles a little bit. And he so he cards Keone really quick. Um, then we make the side change. Um, the first call was the under call on Louie, um, where he comes in, hits a bick, and lands, and he just like he two hand touches on the under the net and brings his hands back. It doesn't impact the play. It doesn't touch it. It doesn't, there's no interference at all. I turn to the down ref and I'm like, he, and, and the down ref makes the call. And I've been having the conversation with this guy all year about the under. We've literally had guys completely on our side. And I'm like, we got seven players. Like, how do we got a guy on our side? And you won't call it. Well, he didn't interfere with the play. Okay. And so I go, look, how do you call that? He said, he was near the play. 
I said, okay, well, now you're changing the definition of it. And every, we're all near the play. Like, I'm near it. You're near it. He's near Like, anyway, so he calls him on the under. And then uh, that's the first point that they awarded on uh, after the side change. The second one was when Alaka'i goes and takes a, a kind of a bang-bang play, and he pushes the ball down, scores. Heno has made a freaking career out of doing this. <laughs> Tread walks up to him and goes, I've done that 10 times this weekend, and you've not called me once. Like, how do you call that ball now? So they give them the second point, calling the lift on Alakai. And then, like, a, a play or two later, we block a ball. Their middle blocker covers it, and he clearly lifts. I turn. I look at the down ref. He is making the silent indicator, which means – the up ref is blocked. He can't see it. He is making the call in real time to end the rally that it's a lift. And the up ref's not calling him it. So I crossed over the little white pieces of tape on the floor and came back going, how, how do you not call that? And uh, the up ref decided that at that point that was enough that they deserved a third point after the side <laughs> change. Because once and, – and, and to, to clarify what he's probably asking, once – a card has been given. Any other card past that is a red. So crossing over the little line where it's like, while well, the ball's in play, frankly, the ball should not have been in play because he should have freaking blown his whistle and ended it because he was clearly he's calling the lift. But uh, anyway, whoever, thanks for asking that question. <laughs> Jesus. Well, let's just also hope that uh, not only does that person come to the arena for all three matches or all three days of the tournament, let's hope that uh, – that up official. I don't remember that much about it, just so you know. Like I haven't, Clearly not. It's not like I haven't gone back and Clearly watched not. every one of those replays. And, oh, by the way, I've we've taken them and we've sent them. I had a conversation on Monday morning with the head of officials. And he's like, Charlie, I heard. And he sent them to me. Um, uh, so we've, we've – he goes, I will use these to help educate officials in the <laughs> future on what not to do. And on that note. We're going to take our final break <laughs> from Ruby Tuesday here in the Moonlow Shopping Center right here on ESPN Honolulu. ESPN Honolulu. 
Final segment here for Ruby Tuesday here in the Moan Lewis Shopping Center. Tiff Willis here along with head coach Charlie Way. We've had such a great time, a lot of great texts, some in-person questions as well. Uh, some housekeeping notes. Uh, first time Hawaii's playing in, on quarterfinal Thursday. Hawaii plays the 6th seed UC Santa Barbara. Uh, 7 o'clock scheduled first serve. Uh, the athletic department has asked fans to wear green, not just for Thursday, Friday, but also Saturday. So if you're a Hawaii fan coming on down, wear your best green. Uh, get your tickets. You're still available. HawaiiAthletics.com, e-ticket, Hawaii.com. Coach with the NCAA automatic qualifier on the line April 20th. You've mentioned that is in play for you to be to win it. You have to be in it. What's it going to take against Santa Barbara on Thursday to at least get you to semifinal Friday? Well, obviously, um, you got to slow down. Uh, the opposite, Bianchi. You know, he's. Um, I mean, heck, he he's probably he's probably got the best numbers in the league. If it's not better than Heno, it's pretty close. He's been a dominant six rotation point scorer. And you know, the disturbing part for me when we played them, I, I'm not sure he broke a sweat. Like you look at him the whole time, and he's. Or we're looking at stuff this week. He's actually better in the back row, which is such an anomaly. Like that's a Rado Parapunov, where you're you're actually better from the back row, um, and the triple block than you are in the front row. You just don't see that very often. So um, we're going to need to contain him for sure. You're on the same side of the bracket as UC Irvine. You went 2-1 and one against them this season. But for you, all the focus, all the scout, and all the attention is for UC Santa Barbara. You guys haven't played three matches in three days, and that could be a case this week, and we hope that's the case, when you get to Saturday and you play, your, it will be their third match in three days. But how, how do you focus and scout all potential five teams when you have the most important one is on Thursday. Yeah, and again, in league play like this, it's it's harder at the NCAA tournament because you haven't played them all. With this, you know, we got, you know, we played Irvine a couple weeks ago. We've played everybody in it. You have the scouting report kind of, you know, it's kind of save as, update the stats. They're they're not really changing. Nobody, nobody's really had – actually, Irvine has made – or, excuse me, Santa Barbara has made one change um, – well, two actually. The the um, the freshman middle blocker Josh Aruya, uh went out with a broken foot. He'd sprained it against us, and then they tried to play him, and it um, and we heard that he heard it crack like the next oh, week no. of practice. So so he's out, and um, they they got another guy. They were platooning the three guys, so that's a, a small change to their lineup. But um, another outside hitter, a guy that they were using as a serving sub, is now a six rotation um, number eight. Uh, Sam Collins is a uh, six rotation attacker for them but again a guy that's you know been around we've seen him it, it doesn't change it all that much you mentioned Santa Barbara of course with Jess Bianchi that right set attacker 32 kills career high on that second night against you guys um how do you slow him down yeah, we actually did a nice job against him in the front row and, and more so in the back row Capone was saying today like how about we just not block him like when he's in the back row <laughs> where which would be a you know that would make for, for some interesting, interesting questions on call the coach the following <laughs> week if we did that where you chose not to block their best player. Um, yeah, he's um, like he's been doing against everybody all year. And he's just one of those guys that can kind of hang and bang. And, he, you know, it's, his, it's, it's not real traditional. It's not real high thunder all the time. He, he hits it at different, uh, you know, points. In, in his jump on the at the top on the bottom you know difference in between so really hard to defend um you you just have then they set him so often that you know you you really you you're it's a combination of getting some good touches on him playing some good floor defense and just trying to neutralize it where he's going to get the kills he just can't hit like five six hundred or you're really in trouble it's the last run for a group of your seniors what has been their approach coming into this week of the the regular the now the postseason rather yeah, I know. I, I think this is a pretty comfortable time of the year for them. You know what I mean? We've um, they've had amazing careers. We've played in championship matches, and you know, f literally their entire careers, all the way back. Um, you know, we've been in playing in the final the NCAA final all the way since 2019. So um, this is familiar territory for them, and uh, really looking forward to seeing them shine this week. For some of your first year starters, and they're f not only true freshmen, but you've also have a sixth-year senior who's now a first-year starter with Olakai Todd. But for guys like Tred and for Louie, what has there been approach and has there been any advice from maybe not just the coaching staff but maybe some of the former players that have kind of 
come through the program playing pro or now they've retired? Has there been any sort of like communication throughout the season, maybe coming into this week? Yeah, well, the, throughout the season, we've we've done this for a while. Josh Walker started a long time ago where we you know, kind of have this, you know, alumni talk, come in and share stuff um, with them. And, um, you know, Costas Theo Heredes will be here this week, and he, he's a guy that's been around the team a little bit. But really for the young guys, they're just dumb and don't know what they're doing. They're just out there playing and having a blast, and they don't, <laughs> I don't think they really care. Like, they're just, they're just going and, and getting after it. We know how important it is to play at home, but especially with having been on the road for two weeks, yeah, you guys came home in between the Irvine and San Diego trip, but to play at the Stan Sheriff Center this week, how big is it? It's huge, you know, and I, I was thinking that earlier today, just looking at the guys and the vibe from it, that while I was disappointed that the league put us on the road two weeks on two weeks in a row to end the regular season, um, I think it could be a blessing because the guys really understand, like, this is a different deal, and uh, we all miss it and getting back in there, and it's just it's just a different vibe getting in the fan, Stan Sheriff Center, and uh, you know, like I've said all night, I, I, we're really looking forward to getting back in there and competing. Is that more of a conference deal? Or, I mean, obviously you're not going to say, hey, guys, can you schedule us back-to-back -back on the road? But is that more of just a how, how just sort of unfolded when the conference schedule came out? Yeah, you know, a lot of this I've quit trying to figure it out. I, I would put that kind of decision in the category of, like, the NCAA, some of their decisions. I think they use a Ouija board, um, <laughs> and you just kind of go with it. I have another, another question here on, on Facebook from Lewis that says, Coach, and you've talked about, you know, the RPI and the KPI and the strength of schedule and whatnot, but, you know, the AQ is your easiest way to get in the, conf in the NCAA tournament. But this, this question comes in and asks, what are the chances of your team getting an at-large bid? What do you guys need to do this week? Outside of winning the conference tournament, getting the AQ, what has to happen at bare minimum? Well, obviously we've got to win Thursday, and, uh, and we've got to win Friday. I think if we're in the final, we're in. Frankly, you know, it would give us a th the 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 team that we're competing for for the the second at large. I think that I don't think I've, we we talked about this earlier in the year. I don't think there's any chance that either league, either West Coast league, gets both at large bids. You know, the the league winner, the tournament winner from both the MPSF and the Big West will get in, and probably the team in the final. Um, and if it is us in the final, that will have we will then have a 3-1 advantage over the other team that's under consideration. Um, again, it's a Ouija board. I don't know what to tell you. Like they, they, It could lead them towards uh, giving it to someone that we have a 3-1 head-to-head -head advantage, but uh, we win – uh, we win Thursday, and fortunate enough to get in the final on Saturday. I like our chances. Players we know have game day routines, superstitions. As a head coach, what is your game day routine? Uh, you know, it's a lot like every other day. There's some of it's a little just a little different, just because the logistics of it. But um, you know, you, you gotta take the dogs out in the morning and uh, <laughs> uh, kind of scurry around the hills of Kailua and. Um, and then come in and just kind of, you know, watch some more film and just kind of, you know, kind of get a, a, any questions that I might have um, or, you know, that have come to me um, and, and finish off any, any kind of thoughts in my mind about the scouting report. And we got serving pass at 2 o'clock, and, you know, that's always kind of a light kind of 45-minute thing. And then we, got a, a, we go in and watch film and, um, and a, a meal at, uh, you know, around 3 o'clock and, um, and then we kind of, you know, I go up to the office and, you know, th this week will probably be no different where you kind of check some scores and see what's going on. Is there something that's kind of pressing in the inbox with the email I got to take care of? And then, you know, you know, by the five o'clock hour, start getting ready to, to head back down to the arena. We meet, um, you know, 545 and uh, kind of wrap up the what we're doing and guys are out on the court and it's go time. And lastly, coach, any superstitions that you have? No, sir. No? No special shirt, no lucky socks, no no nothing? Clean underwear works and, you know, you know no matter what, you know. Quickly, uh, Dowdrigger playing three matches in four days. How did that help prepare you for this week when it could be – and hopefully it's three matches in three days. Yeah, I mean, and, and historically the outrigger is three matches in three days and hopefully will be again next year. That was, again, a gift from the Big West to kind of throw that curveball to us. But, uh, you know, playing three matches in close proximity like that, um, 
you know, it's good. It's good mentally, physically. It's, it's, it's funny how many times teams kind of push back on that. You know, we did the same thing back on the road in Indiana in January. We played back-to-back nights in um, – in Fort Wayne and then drove down and played in uh, at Ball State. I like putting us in that position uh, at least a couple times throughout the year where you got to win three matches in a short time. Um, one, because whether it's the league tournament or the NCAA tournament, inevitably you're going to have to do it at some point to win a championship. Thursday night, be right around the corner, 7 o'clock, second quarter final against 6th seed UC Santa Barbara. Coach, we will all be wearing green. We will see you Thursday, and we hope Friday, and we hope on Saturday again, hawaiiathletics.com to get your tickets as well. Coach, this hour has flown by. We'll see you on Thursday. It has. Thank you, and I appreciate everybody coming down tonight. It's a For great Rick crowd. You know, we, and uh, Chris Hart didn't big time us this week. He showed up, you know, for, probably because it's the last one, but uh, – Appreciate you guys being here throughout the year. I really do. And uh, let's get it done this week. Let's get it done this week. Thank you again to Rick Nagashima here at Ruby Tuesday here in the Molino Shopping Center. Again, for every, all of our sponsors as well, for everyone coming on down, Tiff Wells, head coach Charlie Wade, our final call the coach here of 2024. We'll see you on Thursday. Wear your green, Hawaii and Santa Barbara. You've been listening to Call the Coach right here on ESPN Honolulu. You've been listening to Call the Coach with Charlie Wade on ESPN Honolulu, the official audio home of University of Hawaii Sports, presented by PAXA and also brought to you by HGEA, Hawaii Pacific Health, Castle Resorts and Hotels, HCAMP, IBEW Local 1186, and Ruby Tuesday Hawaii, 